for our 2021 Virtual Science Expo. Okay, thank you, thank you. And we have our first presenter, Tani. You, you, can, you can sit at the desk, you'll, you'll be in the camera, move forward towards the desk and you can move forward to your presentation. How does the heat affect the yeast to rate the yeast to rate of rising and how will it affect the fluid? Background information. A higher temperature also increases the yeast sensitivity to the lactic and acid, acidic acids, which causes a lower ethanol yield. Yeast can usually tolerate short term um, in temperature. However, operating above ideal temperatures for longer stretches of time can significantly reduce ethanol yield. Hypothesis. If the dough rises before it goes in the oven, then the yeast will move faster and make for bigger, fluffier system. Procedure. Make the dough, let the dough rise, fill the dough and roll it. Slice and fill the pan, let rise, put it in the oven for heat to finish the rising, put on the That's the step. Okay, great. A series of pictures uh, of your of your work. Keep going. Was your hypothesis correct or incorrect? My, my hypothesis went exactly like I thought it would. I thought of I thought letting the dough rise mul multiple times before the oven would make them bigger, bigger, and it worked. Conclusion: And what would you do differently? When I make these again, I will definitely let the dough rise after it comes out of the mixer and before I fill it, and will let them rise in the pan before I put them in the oven. The end. Okay. Excellent. Did did any of your um, experiments involve the heat of the room? Like if the day was a little hotter, that the the, the dough um, was able to rise a little bit more? Did you get to look at that, or would that be something you would want to follow up on and try next time? I think that if, the, if it's hotter in the room, then it will rise faster. Okay. Good. Anything else that you would try for your next experiment? Okay. Great. Excellent. Okay, good. Okay, good job. Who do we have up Okay, you want to go? That's fine. No problem. Go for it. Fires. The ingredients are isopropyl alcohol, powdered sugar, cane sugar, baking soda, nine inch rounds, sand, lighter fluid, lighter, and measuring spoons and mixing bowls. My research question was if I use powdered sugar versus cane sugar, then will I get a better or worse result? Background information the sun is on the fire snake. The fire snake uses sugar and baking soda to create the reaction that produces the fire snake. When you light it on fire and the baking soda gets hot, it makes carbon dioxide gas. The pressure from this gas pushes the carbonate from the burning sugar out, producing the snake like shape. My chemical equation is that the carbon in the re reaction makes the snake black. The overall process is exothermic enough that the water produced in the reaction is vaporized. My hypothesis is if I use powdered sugar, then it will be longer than if I use cane sugar. The procedure is to put the sand in a fireproof bowl and, and soak the sand in lighter fluid. Mix together baking soda and sugar, put it on a pile on, the mix, on top of the mixture of sand. Light the mixture on fire, allow the sand to catch fire, and watch as the fire snake emerges. So I recorded my data because I'm going to switch up the mixture and analyze to see if I get better or worse results. I'm going to measure the different amounts. So for example, more or less baking soda or sugar, using powdered sugar versus cane sugar, adding, al adding alcohol or using alcohol instead of lighter fluid. 
So test one turned out pretty well. It reminds, I used cane sugar and baking soda. The, it worked pretty well. It took a few minutes to start off and it was short and it smelled like marshmallows, which was a plus. And I think I used too tall of a bowl. So I need to use a different kind of bowl and I used cane sugar. So next time I'm gonna use powdered sugar with lighter food. And my test two where I used powdered sugar um, did not work so well because the powdered sugar was very clumpy. So a bunch of little snakes come out, came out of all the little clumps of powdered sugar. And so next time I think I'll use normal sugar. And we, uh, that's a picture of the first time and this is a video of the first time. Not sure if it's volume or not. It's visible. I guess there's not volume, but that's what it looks like. It's like very light and kind of like that. Yeah, crumbly. Yeah, like crumbly. And it's kind of like the outside of a marshmallow. Like when you're first eating marshmallow. So, yeah, that's what it looks like. And then test two video, as you can see, the powdered sugar got super duper clumpy. And as you'll see in a minute, the video, a lot of little snakes came out of the fire. Because See, there's a lot of little ones instead of one big solid fire snake. That's because of the clumpiness of the sugar. So was your hypothesis correct or incorrect? It was incorrect. My hypothesis was that powdered sugar would be better and it was worse than the cane sugar. And my conclusion is that the fire snake is a very fun experiment and I highly recommend using cane sugar if you would ever want to try it. And okay, and you also recommend caution? Yes. yes, caution, exercise caution because the fire is fire, so. Right, excellent. Did you consider using brown sugar? I did not because Brown sugar has a lot more molasses, so I think it would just turn into like caramel before the reaction would. Interesting. Happen. Good idea. Excellent. Good. Good fear. Yes. Uh, what you're saying makes sense. I'd love to see it tried, uh, but that makes sense. Okay. Excellent. Good job, Atara. Okay. So now, if they're ready, I think we have AJ. We're ready. Who, uh, who is going? Who is zooming in uh, to present his uh, his science fair project? So, are you ready, guys? We are. Can you see us and hear us? Uh, we hear you. Um, let's see, Mr. Davidowitz. Maybe could you spotlight <laughs> their the their camera? You want to go down here? Okay. We see you now. Okay, perfect. We're going a little further away from the dog. Okay. Not far enough, apparently, but we'll try. AJ, go ahead. Um, so my science fair project is smoke bombs. Well, the, uh, the ingredients of a, a, like a homemade smoke bomb is a ping pong ball, tin foil, a pencil or, or a pen, and a match. So it should look like this at the end. You should wrap the tin foil in, uh, over the ping pong ball with a pencil over here to make a little tube so you could see the ping pong ball. And then it, you just light, uh, light it like that. So my hypothesis is that if you if you like if you don't wrap it tightly, then uh, will it go up in flames? So besides smoke, because uh, uh, because ping pong balls are highly flammable, so it makes uh, so the pin uh, the pin foil just presses down so it doesn't flame up like make fire. So this is with uh, this is a normal one. That's pretty smoky. <laughs> okay. And we'll move further down. Right. Okay. <laughs> it is 
leaving smoke bombs behind us. Okay, go so ahead, Jay. My hypothesis is if you don't wrap it tightly like this, it, it, it should like flame up. So the, this is without anything. This is just a normal thing. It, uh, it just, it goes into flames. That's what I think. That's what I think that without any, without like, without it pressed down hard enough, it will do that. Okay. So this is the one that's not wrapped tightly. Uh, I think that it will smoke. Uh, I, I think it will just go up in like fire like that. So instead of doing anything, it just does nothing. And I think it just, just didn't, no, just didn't work. I'm going to go get another one. Oh, they're right, right here. Right here. Sorry, hang on. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. What are you doing right now? Making it so there's more air. And AJ, the theory is that if there's more air, it'll be able to smoke better? No, that it'll just go into a fire, not smoke. Uh, oh, my theory. Okay. Because, uh, because the air, make uh, fire needs air to... You want to finish what you're saying? The, the fire needs air to do it, to like make fire, but apparently it didn't work. So what's the end of your hypothesis? So it was, no, it, do, it, it does not change if it's more air. Okay. Are you finished with your presentation? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Excellent. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Team Goldblatt. Good job. Mm -hmm. Okay, who's up next for here? For my science experiment, I decided to research how, in what ways temperature affects luminal and its flow. The background information that you should know for this is that luminal is a chemical compound that is often used in crime scene investigations to locate blood. It was invented in 1937 by Walter Specht. I think that's how you pronounce it. Luminal is made by mixing eight carbon molecules, seven hydrogen molecules, three nitrogen molecules, and two oxygen molecules. It, grow, it glows a green-blue color when it comes in contact with an oxidizing agent such as blood. Luminal is still used today. It's used for the same purpose and in the same way as when it first made its way to criminal justice. This is the safety dash sheet for it. My hypothesis is that if there is a lower temperature, then the luminal will grow more, will glow more brightly and for a longer period of time, because it makes sense that a reaction would happen more slowly if the temperature is increased. The materials you need is the luminal kits, uh, styrofoam cups, measuring cups, thermometers, water, and ice. Uh, No, you, I mean, you can just summarize the procedures or you can go right to the data. Um, what I found was that the hot, the luminal and hotter waters stopped 
glowing first, but it, the cold water stopped, but the cold water took longer to start glowing. So my hypothesis was partially correct. Because my hypothesis had two parts, it's able to be partially correct. Um, I was incorrect when I said that it would glow brighter in cold water, but I was correct when I said that it would glow lo for longer. The aluminum in the cold water started glow glowing later and more dimly than the aluminum in hot water, even though the catalyst was added at the same time in the, in the same amount. The aluminum in the hot water stopped glowing sooner than the aluminum in the cold water, although when mixes it started to glow again, then more dimly than before. If I were to repeat this experiment, I would do more trial runs to know what I need to make sure the reaction started at the same time and none of them have any advantage. I would also make sure that the waters were the same temperatures for both times I run the experiments and the amounts of people helping me. One question I still have is why does the, ex the temperature affect the moon? I would keep the same kit, I would keep the same the kit that I used. Good job. Okay, who's up next? You ready to up? Yes. Okay, and Nima, I especially like the fact that you. Um, that you were okay having part of your hypothesis be valid and part that didn't work out. That's that's a really important scientific principle. Focus on what worked, fix what didn't, and and keep experimenting. Great job. Yep, down. Wait, oh, too far. Okay, so the title of my experiment is the what I'm, I'm doing gummy bears and sodium chlorate for my science experiment. And my research question for this experiment experiment is when you add the gummy bears to the melted sodium chlorate, why does it react with sodium chlorate chlorate and start burning and exploding? Why is sodium chlorate flammable? So what I'm doing for my experiment is I'm dropping a gummy bear, maybe one, I'm dropping one or two gummy bears into sodium chlorate once it is melted with the flame. And then there is a reaction and it starts combusting and there's fire and smoke. So the background information is that um, it quickly heats up and starts to melt. When you drop the gummy bear in, the sugar is now exposed to oxygen from the melted sodium chlorate, and the combustion reaction starts causing the flame that you see. That's what I was explaining. And therefore, this creates more heat, causing the reaction to happen even faster and more fever. So more oxygen is released, more sugar is burned, and more calories are released from the test tube. So this is. Um, the chemical formulas for the sodium chlorate, the sucrose from the gummy bear, and the products and the decomposition reaction. So this is this is when sodium chlorate decom decomposes into uh, in, in sodium chlorate that's that is not melted. That NaCl. So you, um, I'm not gonna read all of that, but this is my source. And then these are the these. This is the overall chemical reactions for sodium chlorate and regular gummy bear sugar, C C12H22O11, and NaCiO3. NaCl, yep. NaCl3. Good. So why is melted sodium chlorate flammable? Melted sodium chlorate is not combustible, but it's a strong oxidizer made up of sodium and chloric acid, which creates the compound NaCl. What makes this a strong oxidizer, or what makes it flammable is the chloric acid. Chloric acid is a type of acid from chlorine that is highly flammable and is a strong oxidizer. The chemical sodium chlorine is stable at room temperature when the acidic oxidizable substances and ammonium salts from the sodium are not present. However, when heated and melted, it is a potent fire hazard and oxidizer and reacts 
from any organic material, such as wood, it could um, it can react with gummy bear sugar. Some examples include wood, sulfur, sulfuric acid, and various metals. So my hypothesis is that if you drop in more gummy bears, you drop if you drop in more gummy bears, the ones you drop into melt in sodium chlorate, then the longer the gummy bears will burn and melt and start combusting. This is because the melting sugar is now exposed to large amounts of oxygen from the melted molten sodium chlorate, which is flammable. These are the materials, sodium chlorate gummy bears, paper, safety goggles, gloves, and tongs. My procedure is that I'm gonna gather the safety equipment, put it on for a teaspoon in of sodium chlorate, heat it until it's melted, and then use the tongs to grab a gummy bear, step away and record the data via camera and or a timer. So for me, I'm going to record a data mainly using a video. I was gonna do a graph, but I decided to record it with a video. And I am going to pull up video quickly. Is it in your drive? Um, yes. So let's go this way. Yes, this is the video. Okay, so this is, um, I actually, I was not able to upload the second video with two gummy bears in the, so, um, in my Google Drive because it, it was uh, it was too long of a video, so it had too much space that it would take away. But this is the video with one gummy bear, and of course that, and of course the other video with another gummy bear was had even a bigger. Can I put it louder? Yes. Yeah. So, it's about one minute video. Oh, computer audio. It's not connected to the phone. Do you want me to go? Yeah. Do Oh, there we go. There we go. So in this experiment, this is the third time I'm trying it, and my teacher came over with her fiance to help me with the experiment. So this is yeah. Robbie. I'm doing step away. Instead of simply having the same reaction, it still was more bright and reaction happened for longer with two gummy bears. I, the reason that I was not sure if it would have a bigger reaction is because if there is already sugar, sometimes reactions don't get bigger if there's more of it. And that happens with some chemicals. So that's why it was a, uh, I was in doubt, but 
in the second video, you can see how it took no. longer for the carbon and sugar to melt, but once it did, the flask lit up like a light bulb. I don't have the second video, but when, it read, when it's ready, I would definitely want to show you. Okay, so this is the conclusion. This is, again, the combustion reaction. This is the product. It creates oxygen, water, and CO2 when they uh, go together, when they uh, react with each other. And you can read, um, one thing I can look at is that the reaction doesn't completely happen right away. Though I was right with the instantaneous reaction, the actual vivid, bright, and strong part of the final product that was observed happened a minute later when the chlorate finally melted the gummy bears. That was one thing that I did not know would happen because it took about a minute to finally melt and then have the real reaction. Uh, so yes. And then a candle, simple lighter is not efficient. The melting point of sodium chloride exceeds 3 degrees Celsius. And to melt it, you need something hotter and more direct to the chemical in the beaker. And the third time I used it, we used a, a, uh, a, a specialized gas lighter that was more efficient than a simple lighter and didn't work as much. You can read this, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but the main gist of um, the paragraph is that one thing I would definitely change is the flame and, and the two things that I was not expecting is that the, the torch, I needed to use a butane torch, that was the more efficient as compared to the candle or simple lighter. And the second thing overall would be that um, that with the second gummy bear, it was only a bigger reaction once the gummy bears melted and that I needed to wait two minutes, around two minutes, a minute, 30 seconds um, until the sodium chloride reacted completely and the gummy bears melted and turned into liquid. So that is two things you can read this, um, but thank you. Excellent. Okay, good job, Akira. Okay, who's next? Go ahead, Margalee. My materials for was a water bottle, coal, ice, rock salt, and a thermometer. My research, my research question is the rock salt freezing the water, but not all the way through. Background information. We need when, when you use the salt and ice to drop the temperature in the chill moisture below the normal freezing point of water, this is, this is called freezing point depression. This is very cold salt water can be used to cool up their water and soda samples below their normal freezing. Discover which of them can be super cold. You might also discover which samples freeze at their normal freezing point no matter what, when, mo when water freezes, the molecules come together in a very or orderly way and form a crystal a crystal line structure. Because of this, water mo molecules as ice have less energy than water molecules as liquid. That means to go from liquid water to solid water, molecules have to lose heat energy. In other words, as super cold water freezes when you tap or open it, it also warms up the rest of the water. This may allow only 10 or 20% of the water to freeze. That accounts for a slush being in the instead of being uh, instead of being in solid chunk. Form formation of ice crystals happens very quickly, but they heat flows so slowly in the water. When, when water is cooled to its freezing point, ice crystals begin to collect in the water. Like snowflakes, these crystals need something on which to grow, and they use microscopic microscopic impurities in the water or locations on the bottle to, 
just do that. If you work with really pure water and cool it slowly to produce cold, super cold water as a liquid, there's a different outcome. When an impurity as an, an ice crystal as, is added to this super cold, pure water, it leads the crystallization process even more. The water, the water instantly freezes solid with no slush in it. In it anywhere. It's called snap freezing. If you super cold soda water or soda pop, there are some other factors to consider. Okay, great. Um, my hypothesis is if it freezes when you slam it, then if you freeze it when you slam it, then you will need rock salt because the ice helps it get cold and the salt helps it not completely freeze. My procedure was to fill a container with a bowl with ice and shove two refrigerator two plastic water bottles deep in the ice deeply and keep them close to the center of the bowl and scatter and then put ice in bury them in ice, put rock salt on top of it and have use a thermometer into the ice. And the temperature needs to drop to 17 Fahrenheit, which is negative 8 Celsius, if the water gets too much colder and may freeze prematurely. And this sits for a while, and then you strike it against the table, and it should freeze completely. My data, using less salt to see if it goes down to the correct temperature, it didn't go low enough, it only got to 35.1, and then I add a little more salt, and it only went to 20.1. And, and then it went, I added some more salt, and it went to 14.5, which still wasn't low enough. And it does work with a lot of salt, but you really need a lot. And then I tried it with a little less salt than normal, but I did it with negative 8.3 and it was still liquid. And then negative 6.8 well, it's frozen water bottle and it didn't work. Conclusion that I need a lot of salt. Was my hypothesis correct or incorrect? My hypothesis is correct. I thought that the salt would help it freeze. The more salt you put, the faster it drops and then it helps it not completely, but enough to make it work. Yeah, freeze. It helps it for not freeze completely, but enough to make it work. Conclusion of more In conclusion, you can't do it with little or no salt. It doesn't drop to the correct temperature. The salt helps it drop fast enough to the negatives, and also when you slam it, it stops. You need a lot of salt, like a lot, like a lot. If you don't, if you, if you don't, you may look, you may look like the temperature is low enough, but it won't work. I would do it differently by making sure there is enough salt and putting the bottle at the bottom to have it work. I would also make sure to be extra careful with it. And all it won't work without a lot of lot of salt, extra salt and being extra careful. Okay. Excellent. Good job, lady. Okay, did you want to My research question was what makes fire change color and how? Um, my background is very different. Very different minerals, but they release different amount of energy. This energy is transformed into light. Each color of light has different amount of energy, therefore, different minerals produce different energy. Right if an atom electrons lose energy, they drop down to a low energy level. The energy can be released. If you put copper sulfate inside fire, then the fire will be good. If you if you would put alcohol in fire, then the fire will be good. If you put copper chloride 
the wife is satisfied, then the fire would be good. If you put maggot sand sulfate inside fire, then the fire would be white. If you put sodium chloride inside fire, then the fire would be good. If you put copper sulfate, copper chloride, alcohol, magnesium sulfate, potassium chloride, sodium chloride. Alcohol blue fire, copper sulfate blue fire, copper chloride blue fire, magnesium sulfate white fire, potassium chloride purple fire, sodium chloride orange fire. All of that. Um, my address was correct. The fire to charge me. Oh, oops, the word is not okay. Okay. It's different materials. Um, conclusion uh, fire can change color from different materials. In the beginning, we tried to burn a, mix, a mixture of alcohol and mineral solution. It was very hard to burn the solution. We had to absorb the solution. And paper all cards was and then we saw the files. Next time I will use the files and materials. But all overall file change colors pretty cool. Okay, good job to you uh because I'm gonna wrap it here up. Huh? My experiment is does smell affect taste? Question. Does smell affect taste? Age old question that people argue over when they're bored. Today I will once and for all answer this question. Background information. Uh, so these are quotes from different experiments that did the same thing as me before I did. Okay. Um, our brain actually distinguishes between odors that reach these receptors from the food in our mouth and that which is inhaled directly through the nose. If the sense of smell is lost because either odor or odor receptors in the nasal or the connection between the nasal cavity and the brain is severed, then the sense of taste will be disturbed as well, which, it, which will in turn affect taste. It's your sense of smell that accompanies these tastes and provides you with the food's intended intended flavor. Without smell, you are left to rely on those five tastes, which can be bland or unpleasant on their own. Taste and smell together in addition to color, texture, and temperature is what gives you a sense of what you are eating, said Dr. Hallbrook. Flavor is what you experience when all these senses are activated at the same time. And this one is about COVID because that video relates to it. According to one 2020 study, trusted source, a sudden severe loss of taste and smell in the absence of an allergy or other chronic nasal condition could be early symptom of COVID. Hypothesis. If test subjects have access to their nose, then they will be able to... to then they will be more accurate because smell affects taste. Materials, private selection, gourmet jelly beans. Procedure, pull out kids from seventh and eighth grade. Tell them to eat jelly beans and tell me what flavor it is. The catch is the seventh graders had to hold their nose and the eighth graders did not. How am I going to report my that? So if they get it, if the test subjects get it right, and I write, then I write a line, and if they get it wrong, then I write an X. Um, according to that. Eighth graders had seven correct answers and six incorrect answers, while the seventh graders, by their nose bumped, had one correct answer and 12 incorrect answers. Well, your hypothesis correct or incorrect? My hypothesis was correct, and I, and conclusion, and what would you, what would you do differently? 
Chemical equation, smell definitely affects taste. This is because of things called odorants, airborne odor molecules that reflect taste. Little things in our nose called sensory cells pick up these odorants, and that is how we get the full picture of what taste really is. Next time, if I were to do this experiment, I would get nose clips to make sure test subjects can't smell. I would also get cheese to balance their palate, because cheese balance their palate to make sense. What they ate before doesn't affect how they taste what now. And I would get jelly, jelly belly jelly beans to so test subjects would have a better chance at getting the answer right. That's all. Okay. Excellent, Rocky. Very interesting. Okay, good job. Who's next, please? Rafael, you can sign out. So go back, go scroll down, sign out. Sorry, there. My, so I'm doing making spherification juices. Say that again. What do I have? Sphere juice, juice balls. Okay. Or juice, or juice so not so my hypothesis is if we put more sodium in citrate, then the spheres will be bet more sphere like because sodium citrate helps with the reaction. So my background. Did you know that you can do like you can join just about any drink or pure food food into small spheres. The spheres have a great heat gelatinous outside of the liquid center. Molecular gastronomy is it the area of food science science that explores how to make these spheres, as well as the other ways ingredients in our food are physically and chemically changed when we prepare and cook it. In other words, the the molecular gastronomy looks at the molecules in our food and and in our, in our looks at the molecules in our food and how they change. Gastronomy is the study of picking, preparing, and eating in good food. The molecular gastronomy te technique that is used to make food into spheres into spheres of a, has a big name: spherification. Ingredients. A six, 60 cc plastic syringe, and two grams of sodium alginate, two grams of sodium chloride, and 10 grams of sodium citrate. The, these are the Yeah, other. jump to the hypothesis. A, oh no, you said hypothesis. Yeah, the procedures are right. basically you put sodium alginate into the, the drink and um, then you put sodium, and then you put sodium chloride in, I think the, a cup of water, and then you put a drop of the um, drink into the water. So these are the pictures, and then the conclusion. My hypothesis was correct. With the grape juice, it didn't work. With less sodium citrate, but when we added more, it worked. With the Dr. Pepper, it worked automatically. With orange juice, it never worked. With the grape juice, it only worked when you put in more sodium citrate. I think it is because the orange juice has more sugar than the Dr. Pepper and the grape juice. The sugar probably messed with the reaction and stopped it from spherifying and caused it to dissolve. Okay, awesome, Steve. Good job. Okay, and Benny.
a case of a later paper plan launcher. Um, the research question, how further did the catapult go than using your hand to throw an airplane um, background information? In order to take off, an airplane has to generate enough lift to overcome its weight. The faster an airplane goes, the more lift it generates. This is why airport runways are very long. In my project, I'm using a rubber band to build a catapult that stores potential energy, which gives extra kinetic energy to the paper airplane, even in a short distance. It's much more effective than using your wrist. If the launcher goes as planned, then the paper airplane should go further on the launcher than without the launcher. Using our materials, paper, bands, printer pencil, paper pencil, tape stapler, construction materials, and an open area, procedure, draw sketches of the launcher, and I have to build the launcher, build a few paper airplanes and launch and build the paper airplane and see which one went further. I'm going to put the data. I'm going to throw the paper airplane a few times, then launch it a few times to see which one goes further, and then write it down. Um, record of data, the paper airplane launcher made the airplane go 10 more feet than a regular human wrist. My hypothesis was correct, the launcher made the paper airplane go further, and um, we threw it with our hand. Conclusion and what you would do differently. So at first I wasn't sure what my science project would be when my eyes came across the paper airplane launcher. I knew it was the one to do this project. You don't need that many materials. The materials you need are the ones you probably have. If you're in an airplane with my hand, and then I used the paper airplane launcher, but the rubber band was too far from the end, so every time we threw it, it would crash into the carpet. What I did was I folded the cardboard in, and that is how the paper airplane launcher worked. I recommend this project to anyone because it's simple and fun. All right. Hey, Good job, Benny. Very nice. Okay. Uh, okay, everybody, we are, that is uh, wrapping up the seventh grade science fair presentations. In just a couple of minutes, we will be ready for the fourth grade. So if you're here for the fourth grade, please don't go away. And we will head down to the fourth grade classroom now.